O Holy One, we light this third candle and delight in the sparkle of its outrageous reminder to rejoice. Let its flame cast light into shadowy places and show where work is to be done. Let a community of builders be formed in the light of joy. Let joy find home in our hearts and make space for your presence there as we work for justice and peace in the service of love. God be with us, Emmanuel, in this light of joy. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are in the third Sunday in this season of Advent. It is a time in the Christian calendar when we revisit our origin stories, how it is that our tradition and the work of the Spirit has come to be in our own lives. My name is Pastor Kelly Wadsworth, and I serve as the transitional minister here at Alki UCC. We are live this morning, and it is good to see everyone gathering safely from places of hearth and home and shelter. Alki is an open and affirming community of faith celebrating the wide variety of paths that our spiritual lives take us. A special welcome this morning for anyone who may be visiting us for the first or the second or the third time. Thank you for choosing this place as your spiritual practice this week. This is work that we need one another to do. There are certain parts of our tradition that are collective and are communal, and this is one of them. And so we are grateful for your presence. Because we are live streaming today, please, if you are able to keep yourself on mute until our invitations for announcements and coffee hour arise, also, this morning, we are adding some additional layers of cameras and sound. So I would estimate that we are up to 25 plus new pieces of technology from when we first began, which was the third Sunday in March. And if you can remember back that far, our service that third Sunday in March was seven minutes long. It had one laptop that everyone rotated standing in front of, and we had no sound besides the sound that just was built into the computer itself. Fast forward to today, now it is a full-time team of around six to seven folks who make the service happen, plus our 25 new pieces of technology. So we are grateful for those who have put in the time and the hard work to make this possible, to continue to make our separation, one that is a bold expression that we continue to be a faith community committed to remaining together. So let us now find our breath. Let us turn to our call to worship and to that ancient story of holy birth that beckons us once again. Gentle Advent greetings to you all. This is Cinda. Our call to worship this morning is a poem, Into the Darkest Hour, composed by the beloved Madeline Lengo. It was a time like this, war and tumult of war, a horror in the air. Hunger yawned the abyss. And yet, there came the star and the child most wonderfully there. It was a time like this, of fear and lust for power, license and greed and blight. And yet, the Prince of Bliss came into the darkest hour in quiet and silent light. And in a time like this, how celebrate his birth when all things fall apart? Ah, wonderful it is, with no room on the earth. The stable is our heart. Let us now turn to our opening song. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining with us today. 
This first opening song, In the Bleak, in the bleak Midwinter, the writer Christina Rossetti portrays the Bethlehem story, but from her native England. Betsy. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the message translation of, of Isaiah 61, a vision for a people in need of hope. Listen to the word of God. The spirit of God, the master, is on me because God anointed me. I am sent to preach good news to the poor, heal the heartbroken, announce freedom to all captives, Pardon all prisoners. God sent me to announce the year of grace, a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies, and to comfort all who mourn, to care for the needs of all who mourn in Zion, give them bouquets of roses instead of ashes, messages of joy instead of news of doom, a praising heart instead of languid spirit rename them oaks of righteousness planted by god to display god's glory they'll rebuild the old ruins raise a new city out of the wreckage they'll start over on the ruined cities take the rubble left behind and make it new because i god love fair dealing and hate thievery and crime, I'll pay your wages on time and in full and establish my eternal covenant with you. Your descendants will become well known all over. Your children in foreign countries will be recognized at once as the people I have blessed. I will sing for joy in God, explode in praise from deep in my soul. God dressed me up in a suit of salvation, outfitted me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom who puts on a tuxedo and a bride a jeweled tiara. For as the earth bursts with spring wildflowers and as a garden cascades with blossoms, so the master God 
brings righteousness into, into full bloom and puts praise on display before all nations. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for God's living word that reaches through the ages and continues to ask and shape us in how we shall live together. In 2006, I did not take kindly to the news that there were only eight planets instead of nine and that Pluto would be demoted out of what we considered to be our solar system. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. It was my third grade project and I had worked diligently on it and I had accomplished the star for that year. Pluto, however, we discovered some new things that reclassified this planet. But first, after Pluto was discovered in 1930, it was declared to be our ninth planet for the sun. And it was a discovery that at the time made headlines around the globe. The observatory that had seen it, discovered it, was the one who was going to name it. And so there was over a thousand submissions as to what it could be named. The submissions came from all over the world and they ranged from Atlas down to the bottom of the alphabet with Zymal. The name Pluto is named after a Roman god of the underworld and was proposed by Venetia Burley, an 11-year-old schoolgirl in Oxford, England. She suggested it in a conversation with her grandfather, who had been a librarian at the University of Oxford. He then passed it on to a colleague who was a professor who then sent it over by cable to the United States where the observatory was. It made it onto the short list of the top three that would be voted on. The first was Minerva, the second was Kronos, and then the third was Pluto. In 1930, the votes were cast and it was unanimous that Pluto would be the name for the ninth planet and Venetia won a cash prize as a reward. The name soon became embedded within our own wider culture. It was after the planet that Walt Disney took the name for a new character that was going to be Mickey Mouse's canine companion, his sidekick. And so Pluto was indeed named after the planet. There was another habit at the time of naming new elements found, discovered. Plutonium was it of naming them after planets. So Pluto and plutonium are related because of their discoveries, because of their identification around the same period of time. It was a number of decades later in the 1990s, though, that Pluto began to encounter some trouble and some questions with its status as a planet. There were some other objects discovered that were roughly the same size and the definition of planet was looking like Pluto was not going to meet the criteria. And so it eventually, in 2006, Pluto was reclassified as a dwarf planet and not one of the major eight. The public reception was mixed, definitely. There were some who definitely voted for and supported the change. There were others who, for a whole variety of reasons, to include sentiment, didn't want to make the change and wanted to keep Pluto in its original status. There were even a number of wild things that happened at the states, at state levels. States passed resolutions. There was one state that passed a resolution that said, we will always recognize nine planets regardless of the definition of a planet. In 2006, there was a word of the year uh, uh, tradition that happens through the American Dialect Society and the word of the year in 2006 was Plutoed, meaning if you get Plutoed, it means you are demoted or you have been devalued into something lesser than what you were. And even though there is some lightheartedness to whether we really want to commit to eight or to nine planets, there's a deeper thing that happens when we 
enter into this kind of conversation. It's got the sense of like, well, what else isn't true? If there are eight planets instead of nine, like I learned, what else might not be true? The next thing you might tell me is that the earth goes around the sun, which was the pressing and controversial question in the 15th century when Copernicus, among others, but Copernicus primarily suggested that the earth in fact is not the center of the universe with the planets and the sun going around it, but instead the other way around. That the sun is at the center of the universe and that we on earth plus the other planets go around it. Can you imagine being around for that conversation? Can you imagine what it would have been like to have your own beloved earth demoted out of the center of the universe. Talk about losing your footing. Talk about where everything you thought maybe you knew becomes a little bit more wobbly and all of a sudden the ground you're standing on just seems more unsure. It's a little bit harder to tell up from down and left from right which is precisely what was happening to the people who were living through the time of Isaiah from our scripture reading today. They had entered the promised land. They had had for hundreds of years a rich life together, but there came a period of time when the Assyrian and the Babylonian empires became bigger and greater than the Israelites, and they eventually were invaded. Some of the Israelites stayed in their land. Some of them were transported to Babylon. It is in this split scenario, it is in this time of distance and separation from one another with a very uncertain future that Isaiah the prophet writes these words to try to make sense of their suffering, to try to give them some kind of framework in which to understand how to continue to move forward, how not to let despair be the last and the final word of what they can see and what they believe in. Our reading from Isaiah 40 is the first in a section of Isaiah that is distinctly different from what came before. Chapters 1 through 39 are written for a people who are definitely in a time of suffering. It is words that lay bare to the people who have turned away from God's justice, who have turned away from righteousness and turned away from peace and are experiencing the fallout from that. They have been going about this suffering for quite a long time. When Isaiah 40, this particular chapter, which is written a few years later, comes to be. There is a change of tone. There's something of a pause. There's something of a chapter ending and a new one about to start. It is like the first rays of light that show up in the darkness when the night is just getting ready to give way to the next day. The passage uses a number of images to convey what that new day might be like. It says, it is like trading in ashes for a bouquet of roses. It is like being gathered like a lamb into a place of safety and family. It is like being surrounded by the beauty and the, majest the majesty of the mountains. This imagery is trying to make a point. It is trying to get at a deeper truth as our poets will tell us that the imagery is not meant to be literal. It is actually meant to get at something even bigger than it, even deeper than it. And so this trading in of ashes for a bouquet of roses is not something that happens quick or immediately, but it is out of the ashes that something like a bouquet of roses is going to grow and is going to emerge. And so it begs this question, both of them and of us, what part of reality do we put at our center? What is the gravitational pull that orients us, that orients our lives and our understanding of where we are at at this particular moment in time? We are in a time of a lot of epistemological questions, and that's a word that means, how do you know 
what you know. How do we know what we know? Because we know things, but how do we know that we know them? And how, was it, how has it come to be that what we know, how has that come to us? It kind of begs the opposite question as well. What are the things we don't know? And why don't we know the things that we don't know? And it very quickly becomes uh, a place where you can feel like the sand is shifting pretty quickly, that the ground you're standing on is fairly uncertain, that the earth may not be the center of what you had imagined the universe to be, like though our sisters and brothers from the 15th century. And this passage begins to create some of that picture. After a time of great suffering, after a time of ordeal and trial, like the Israelites had had, how do they know what they know? When they imagine a future, when they imagine hope, what fills it in? What informs them as to what they hope for and what they envision to be? It asks them, instead of understanding nine planets, what might an eight-planet life look like? And if that's just the imagery, what does it look like when the way things were are no longer? Is the hope that simply what was will return? Is the hope some kind of pie-in-the-sky reality that could never come to be? Or is our time when we are in the ashes a time where we deepen our roots and we reorient and we re-ask ourselves, what is at the center of what we hope for? Advent is a time to re-ask that question. Prior to Jesus' birth, John the Baptist asked that question and said, prepare the way. Prepare the way which in essence is asking us to look at what is at your center so that you might recognize the coming work of the Christ, so that you might recognize the hand of God among you. Because when it is the holy that is at our center, we can then recognize it that much more easily when it is all around us. At the same time, around the same decade that Pluto was named Pluto in the 1930s, there was a French scholar who was doing similar kinds of work, but on the philosophy and the theology side of things. It was the question of how do we orient ourselves to the world around us in a modern context? His name was Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, and he was a paleontologist, a scholar, a theologian working in France. He visited the United States around the same time that Mickey Mouse had a new friend named Pluto. And this is what Pierre wrote and shared, and I think it is very timely for how we conceive of this period of time, not just in Advent, but in our collective life together. He wrote, above all, Trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something, something unknown, something new. And yet it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability. And that may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you, your ideas mature gradually, and so let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on as though you could be today what time will make of you tomorrow. Only God could say what this new spirit is gradually forming within you and what it will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that a holy hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself both in suspense and incomplete. May that be our advent. 
May we rest in the place where it is okay to be in suspense. It is okay to feel incomplete. It is okay to be on the way to somewhere, but not yet arrived there. Alleluia and amen. Alleluia and amen. with me now by responding to the sermon with this verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. turn to our offering. Generosity may come as an impulse, but it is cultivated by the practice of regular giving. Let us today move from beliefs to actions that make a difference in our world. We give in gratitude of God's gifts to us, and we give because we need to live beyond ourselves. Use this time of offering as an opportunity to grow and to grow the realm of God. Amen. So, hey, people, you can express your generosity through the PayPal link on our website or by mailing in a check to the office or through text to give by texting the word Alki UCC, all one word, Alki UCC, to 44321 and a donation link will appear for you. Your support for Alki is part of a living and thriving heritage as the church embraces her third act and is the place where we find our spiritual nurture and our home. Ten in cotton and 
can't tell you how much joy that brings the choir, brings to us, to bring to you, that we are finally able, with this new technology and this system, to bring um, our love of music to all of you. Let us pray. God of abundance, we give these offerings and material goods as our commitment to give back to you and to care for your people. Let our giving remind us to see Jesus all around us. Use our offerings of money and of our lives for ministry to your purposes. Amen. Amen. This is our time for announcements, so we will begin first with the moment from the ministry teams, and then we'll move into our general announcements. So prepare yourself, if you have a general announcement, to do one of two things. Either take yourself off mute and just jump on in with your first name and then the announcement, or if you put it in the chat box, I can read it out loud to the congregation gathered this morning. But first, let us hear from our ministry team. Hi, this is Sandy. I am from the Caring Community and Fellowship Team. And I thought I would read to you our mission statement, which is as the Caring Community and, ministry, and Fellowship Ministry Team, we provide companionship, connections, and support for members of Alki United Church of Christ. And uh, when I think of fellowship, I hope that you've all heard from an Advent angel during this time. Some of you may know who your Advent angel is, and some of you may be wondering who in the world that could be. But it's some way that we're trying to continue making connections since we can't be together. Um, also, a lot of our members of the caring community are involved with Cinda and the outreach community, whether it's being involved in the food drive or collecting donations for others in need. And for our future, as Pastor Kelly was talking about in the sermon today, we are on our way to be together someday. And in those cases, we want to be sure and get excited about coffee hour. Maybe you can even freeze some cookies for when we do finally get together. Or potlucks. And just other ways we can support one another and someday give, give everyone a big hug. Um, one other thing, I'm counting money today after church. So if you haven't sent your check yet or you want to go back and donate, please feel free to do so. And I'll check that off. Have a great day. Thank you, Sandy. The Advent Angels visited me on Thursday of this week and it really did make my whole day. Um, and if you think, oh, Pastor Kelly, how come an Advent angel made your entire day? Well, because like you, I am also living in a pandemic in the middle of December and it is raining and it is dark and our whole life is on a computer. And so <laughs> these kinds of things, I think, weigh even more heavily and bring even more joy. So do not be shy about getting on the Advent angel list if you are not. So just simply send your name and your email address to the office and the Advent Angels will be more than happy to add you. So don't be shy. Just say, please add me to the Advent Angel list. And an Advent Angel will visit you sometime before Christmas this year. Other announcements for the life of the community. Well, it's Cinda. And we have our food drive and men's clothing going on today. Church will be open till 3 to take your donations. Um, but even more importantly, the gift bags we're making for unsheltered folks, uh, all been shopped for. Thank you, everybody. Bring them on down today. We'll get them put together this week and delivered. And then shopping for our um, 
adopted family is going really well. So many of you have stepped up. The response has been fabulous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've got a couple of the kids still needing some gifts. If gift cards are what you can do, that would be perfect. Even, you know, just just smallest amount goes a long way for this family. So um, be in touch with me and um, let's show our love. Thank you. And any other announcements, if you think of one um, and our service has finished, we can publish it in the Thursday newsletter. So if you think of it later this afternoon, just feel free to send it to the office and we can definitely get the word and the information out. Before we turn to our closing hymn, I want to close us with a word of prayer for all of us who are struggling, for all of us who may have encountered a... Um, grief in this month, whether it is fresh from the experience of COVID or whether we are carrying our grief from family members lost in the past. So I invite you to please join in prayer with me. Holy One of hope and of light, we recognize that those things do not necessarily wash away our grief, our sadness during this time. We remember the families who have lost a dear and a beloved one this season to COVID, to other forms of illness and passing. We remember that your children are reunited with you, but it is our grief and our loss that we carry this month. We ask that it would be the strength and the endurance of your light that carries us through. Give us hearts to be tender to those around us and give us eyes to see the suffering and give us eyes to see the love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>